Yeah, so we're a polished, casual uh, dining concept. Um, founded in 1993, about 28 years old. Uh, we're kind of full service bistro. Of course, we're expanding that and we'll talk a bit about to go, but um, you know, high quality food combined with a great experience, ambiance in the restaurants, and now branching out more towards delivery, takeout, catering, um, and really building out the to-go to model as well. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to sort of digging into what's, sure. what's happening. But sure. uh, look, let's talk about your journey to CEO. Um, mm. You know, uh, it was just a few years ago when you wrote a thesis at, at Harvard 2018 around some of the challenges that PF Chang's are facing, and now it's 2021, and you're CEO. H how'd you get here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I worked for an investor, John Paulson, Paulson & Company in New York after I graduated from Harvard. Um, so I was an investor previously. I did private equity at a firm called CPG and, and investment banking at Goldman and Sachs before that. Uh, so I was an investor, kind of led the deal to acquire P.F. Chang's. It came up for sale in, in 2018 um, and, uh, you know, thought it was a great brand, tremendous opportunity. Uh, Underinvested in certain key areas, we thought the off-premise business could grow uh, tremendously. That hadn't been tapped. Um, you know, we thought there was a lot to do with the dining business as well, international expansion. So we just we, we love the brand. We thought it was a great investment opportunity, and so we acquired it um, end of 2018, beginning of 2019. I initially got involved as a director, uh, and then got more involved operationally, became chief strategy officer, and then eventually, in the middle of COVID, in April of 2020, I uh, was asked to, to lead it as CEO. Okay, okay. So you mentioned a few of the things that the brand was facing when, sure. you, when you saw, when you first came across the brand. So when you guys joined up with Triartisan uh, Partners and you acquired, mm -hmm. what was, can you dig a bit more into what the situation was like there? What, what, what opportunities really weren't being hit on at that point? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I describe it as, you know, a tremendous brand. And anybody you talk to, you know, knows P.F. Chang's, grew up near one, loves it, et cetera. Um, you know, low, rele low, low immediate relevancy. In other words, there hadn't been a lot done in terms of marketing to stay top of mind. Uh, we thought the food was great, and we traveled across the country. We tasted them kind of, you know, various states, various cities. Uh, you know, consistent, high-quality food. We thought the experience within the restaurant, though, was lacking, right? So, um, you know, you walk into a restaurant, the food is good, but you, you're really just coming for a meal. There wasn't the whole experience around it. Um, and we were in New York, we'd go to Tao and, and some of these other places, and, you know, Tao, the food is fine at Tao, but what people really come for is the experience, for the fun, for the, uh, the dynamism when you walk in, the excitement. Um, and we thought that was something we could inject into the concept. Um, you know, good design doesn't have to be expensive. It's colors, it's, it's lighting, it's music, it's, it's, you know, these sort of things. Um, so we thought that was a huge opportunity in the dine-in segment, which we thought we could grow. Um, and then we looked at the off-premise business, which um, when we bought the business was less than 20% of their sales. And if you look at, you know, Chinese food more broadly, it's 50-50. It's, it's, you know, the original takeout food. It, it, you know, you should have a nice, you know, they had that 20% almost by accident. There was very little being done to, to foster growth in, in that side of the business. Um, so, you know, we looked at that and thought we could really accelerate growth there. We could, you know, sign deals with the third parties that made sense. We could, you know, develop an, a, a, an ordering platform on the website, which they didn't have, an app, you know, the packaging. And we just saw a ton of opportunity to drive that business as well. Um, and then the third thing was the, you know, international expansion, right? So we bought it, it was about 200 units, 215 in the U.S., um, another 95 or so internationally. And we thought that international business could be, you know, you could add hundreds of units working with the right partners, uh, which, you know, we and Triartisan, you know, had businesses that have international franchising. So, you know, we felt great about the opportunity to expand there as well. So it really kind of three parts to our thesis, improving dine-in sales by investing in the experience driving off-premise sales, and then that later also became P.F. Chang's to go. Um, and then also, you know, international unit expansion was, was a key opportunity for us. Right, okay. A lot of things there I want to jump into that in a bit more detail in a sure. bit, but... It was a long to... thesis, a, so, lot, a, lot, a lot of pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how many pages? <laughs> uh, well, the Harvard, the Harvard case kept a couple, but there's a lot more behind it, for sure. Yeah. Now, I just want to zoom out a bit, though, and just look at, you know, a lot of the things you mentioned there apply to casual dining in general sure. across that, that segment of the industry. In fact, a few years ago, was, I think it was 2019 on the stage here in Restaurant Spaces, we had a representative and a panel from a, a casual dining chain saying, 
You know, we're not gonna, we're not really gonna dry, dive into delivery. We're not really gonna focus on off-premise. It's not really, it's not what we do. Mm -hmm. We're gonna focus on the dining experience. And I remember thinking, that's crazy. Uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years now, and uh, a lot of things have changed for that particular brand. But, yeah. Uh, why do you think, specifically with off-premise and and uh, digital ordering, why do you think it's been so hard for that segment to really get their head around it? And, you know, we encountered the same attitude in the company as well when we bought it. Um, and I think you know, restaurant people are restaurant people, and they viewed the off-premise business as a distraction, um, as an, you know, this annoying thing they had to deal with, the DoorDash guys coming in, kind of messing up the flow of their restaurant, et cetera. Um, and it almost helps, I guess, to be coming from the outside and see it more as an opportunity, which, which we did. Um, and there's ways to, you know, I agree, you don't want the third party guys sitting in your lobby, but there's ways to fix that without giving up on the business entirely, right? So we had second entrances, for example, have them come in. So, you know, we, we, yeah, a lot, there was, the, the attitude generally was, um, you know, casual dining is casual dining, off-premise is a different thing that people didn't really want to engage. Obviously, it created an opportunity for us because we were able to underwrite, us, you know, different levels of growth and profitability in that business than uh, people who were in the space. Um, so, you know, we've changed the attitude at the, at the company. It's almost like running two businesses out of one box. Right? There's no reason because you grow off premises, you need to sacrifice on your dining business. You know, we're investing in that too. We're remodeling restaurants, making that um, you know as as, as you know, profitable as possible. But at the same time, you have this whole other business that can drive utilization of your kitchens. You know, increase uh, increase your your AUVs um, and your overall profitability. So why not you know take advantage of that? Right? And it involved some investment. We had to spend money to build a website, had to spend money on the app, had to, you know, these separate entrances do cost money, um, and a lot of other things, but we thought it was a very high return opportunity and a great chance for growth, even before COVID, and then obviously COVID proved us, proved us right in a way that none of us, um, you know, wanted or, or hoped for, uh, but, but it did kind of accelerate that trend, and we had invested pretty heavily ahead of it in the year after we bought the, bought the company in 2019. So, you know, um, the timing was such that we were, we'd made the investments, we were able to shift people from dine into off-premise when COVID did hit, um, and that helped us fare, you know, a lot better than our peers during that period. Yeah, okay, so, and I guess, what did that do in a mindset kind of way as well when, when the pandemic hit? It was a, a, a big validation, I guess, and uh, mm -hmm. what did that do internally in the organization? You know, I think industry-wide, it, it proved the value of, of having an off-premise business, and, and it forced people who didn't want to deal with it to have to deal with it um, and come up with a plan for their companies, whatever that may be. Um, you know, for us, it, 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 you know, we were certainly, again, fortunate that we, had, we came in believing in it from the very beginning, and uh, we built the team around it. That's been our strategy. We, you know, we, tend, we, we like to stay very focused. Our strategy really hasn't changed since we bought the business. Um, the timeline accelerated. But you know, when I took over, I had you know kind of these five bullet points, and those are the same now as as when we started, right? So off-premise was you know, people either bought in or we found people who did buy into building that business, right? It it wasn't really an option. We just thought it was that important um, for our future and for our company. Um, so for us, it's some validation, but again, it doesn't it didn't change what we were trying to do. It just accelerated it and uh, maybe increased the emphasis a bit more, you know, post-COVID. Right. Now, I'd like to drill into the to-go concept uh, a little more now. So sure. uh, your you normal traditional PF Chang's is about 7,000 square foot. This is one and a half to 2,000 square foot. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you just mentioned, you, you put all this into motion before COVID was even on the radar. So first one opened in January last year. In February, but yeah. February, sorry. Same. My, Close. my bad. And uh, you're going to have, was it 50 by the end of this year, heading into ne next year? End of next year. End of next year. So not in the next... Uh, Two months, but okay. a year after that. You should um, be doing better. Come on. No, right. <laughs> uh, well, look, I mean, that's, I mean, first of all, yeah. what a crystal ball you've got or there. Uh, I mean, did you bring the crystal the, ball? The, the timing was there? lucky, you know, but, yeah. but it, it, it certainly looks smart in retrospect. But we opened the first one in, in February in Chicago. And, and, you know, just to explain what it is, it, you know, so we have in our traditional restaurants, we do off-premise sales, right? So our restaurants have, you know, the dine-in business and then we have a to-go business in our restaurants. So that we do everywhere, and we have, and we're growing that. The to-go format is just a new unit format, right? So when we thought about deploying new capital, you know, you can build a full 7,000 square foot restaurant, but there's certain places where that doesn't really make sense, right? Maybe some urban environments, maybe uh, so low, some lower volume suburban environments where 
you might not be able to build a full restaurant, but could you enter with a smaller unit, 1,500 square feet, 2,000 square feet, and do takeout delivery and catering out of that unit um, and make that make sense economically, right? So it, it increases your white space opportunity and how many units you can open if you can put them in more places, right? So that's to go. Um, and we opened the first one again in downtown Chicago and River North in February. And our first markets were urban markets because we saw that as the biggest opportunity for where we couldn't open bistros, but we could probably open to-goes. Uh, so the first seven we did were New York City and Chicago. Now, good timing in that to-go became an important thing. Also bad timing in the sense that we budgeted a lot of office sales in these downtown locations. Um, and post-COVID that more or less went away, but the residential picked up enough that they still kind of worked out. Right, um, so we opened you know, the first seven uh, in these downtown locations. Now we've opened a few more in suburban locations, Texas, Florida, uh, one in Long Island. Um, and you know, we're seeing really great results because they're not as affected obviously by the, by the office occupancy decline that uh, you're seeing in the downtown locations. So it's, it's, you know, we're still opening bistros. We still you know, are a casual dining company. Uh, but this, this gives us more flexibility, right? So if you find a market that's a great market but can't quite sustain a bistro, you have an option of how to enter. Um, and the other thing we're finding is our international partners you know, love it, right? It gives them more flexibility. They can sign up for more units because they have you know, a, a different model that they can put in lower volume uh, places. So it creates more flexibility here and then for our partners internationally as well. Yeah. What was that process like um, of getting the infrastructure in place to be able to get that format up and running in that year? That yeah, we were asking a lot, you know, and we bought the business, and you know, in the first year, there was so much we wanted to do. So we're working on the remodels, we're working on the uh, uh, off-premise outside of the inside of the restaurants, we're working on this to-go concept. Um, but you know, we we moved quickly. I, you know, that's part of why I started coming out to to, to Scottsdale, where we're headquartered, to be more involved, with to drive uh, progress on this initiative. Um, but people responded. The team really proved to be, you know, ambitious, ad adaptable, flexible, uh, creative. You know, coming up with, with solutions every time we ran into a, a potential problem. Um, you know, so kudos to the team. You know, people stepped up, and and you know, we got this launched about a year after we bought the business, which is you know pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and but that, again, it proved it proved to be a good thing that we had it done that quickly. Um, and then it, you know, it wasn't perfect when we launched it. We had to make tweaks and adjustments, and and we still do. Um, but it was nice to kind of get something out there to see the response, see the consumer reaction, and then, and then take it from there. Yeah, well, talk to me about that, just the, the way the response has been like, because obviously, you know, I mean, for a lot of casual dining concepts, they wouldn't have ever thought of doing something like this. So uh, what has the response been like from your customer base? Very positive. You know, people are happy to, because again, everybody kind of knows PF Chang, so you get to markets where the, one doesn't exist and you put it to go. People are generally happy to see it, um, you know, what we've learned is a few things. One, for the to-go concept to maximize our, the economic output and the ROIs, you really, it's a sales-driven concept for us, right? So we are better, for example, putting them in, on Main and Main and some of these markets where you get all the walk-in business, the drive-through business, um, versus you know, hiding it to reduce rent, as an example, right? So there's some locations where maybe we're focused on the cost, we should've been focused on the revenue opportunity, and we've gotten better at, at that. Um, we learned that some seating is a good thing for people, right? Uh, and we initially just made them, uh, you know, off-premise driven concepts, but, but some seating, even if it's not service, uh, is something that people want. And so the new, con the new ones we're opening have some, uh, you know, limited service or no service seating. Um, you know, the quality is number one. We knew that coming in, but it's been reaffirmed when we've opened them. People, you know, you call it PF Chang's to go, it needs to be PF Chang's quality food. So the kitchens, need to run the same, be the same, have the same uh, investment in the people and the chefs, training, et cetera, to make sure the quality stays high. Um, and and with, you know, with those things, we're seeing remarkable success. Uh, we just opened a unit in McKinney, Texas that's doing maybe 60% better than we underwrote on, on top line. Um, that one has a drive-through lane, it has a Chang's lane, we call it. Um, it's pickup, so you don't order through it, but you call ahead, you drive through the Chang's lane and you pick up, and we're just seeing tremendous volume with that. Um, so we've learned a lot, and each you know, one we open gets you know, a little better, a little closer to kind of the ultimate version, uh, but we didn't wait to perfect it to launch. We launched and then improved, um, and that's, that's you know, worked out pretty well for us so far. Yeah. Do you have an idea, and I guess this is going to uh, differ from location to location, but what's the makeup of the, the customers or the, the people coming through those, whether it be delivery workers, mm. uh, people who have ordered ahead, or ordering at the spot? 
It, it does vary. Mm -hmm. So one like FIDI in, in New York has like 60% walk-in business, but it's a busy walking area and you have a lot of people kind of pop in, pop out. Um, in McKinney, it's 65 to 70% order ahead, whether that's delivery or pickup. Um, and then, you know, some 30-ish percent driving business. So it does, it does vary uh, based on the market. Um, but the key is to have, uh, you know, the throughput to manage either, right? To be able to manage a bunch of people coming in and organize that and make sure that people know when their order is going to be ready so they, their expectations are set. They're not, um, you know, waiting without any idea when it's going to be ready. So we, we, we create a system that works for both. And, you know, I, I always talk about being channel agnostic in our core business and same is true in to go. You know, they want to come pick up, they want to have it delivered. It should be all fine and we should be able to manage, um, you know, any channel that, that, you know, people choose to engage with us through. Right? Yeah, I like that term, channel agnostic. Mm -hmm. You've been, uh, I know, Peddling uh, in the last. Peddling is a great word. Yeah, there you go. It's, uh, <laughs> you've, you're one of those people. You create a term, and now everyone's <laughs> going to start using it. We, you know, we've got to no. be more channel agnostic. Um, no, it's really great. So I guess then, with that in mind, uh, how do you see the makeup of the portfolio in general as you go towards the ultimate version of this? And I mean, do you have an idea of what that percentage is going to be like? No, but I want to be flexible. So I, I don't have a target number, but I want to. Um, I want to be able to grow. Uh, and look at each market and make a decision about as to what fits. Um, so it, it opens more markets for us to enter. So then it's an ROI equation, right? Like what makes the most sense here? What kind of revenues can we get? What's our cost structure look like? Um, and do you open, you know, we have basically three models now. We have a flagship model, which we put in these high volume, you know, really dense locations. Vegas is an example, Atlantic City. We're opening one in Union Square. We opened one in Honolulu. Um, and these are, you know, big, you know, 12,000 square foot maybe, 10,000 plus typically, um, but they do tremendous volumes and the ROIs are fantastic. Now, you can only open so many of them because there's only so many markets that can support one, um, but that's one option. Then you have our traditional bistro restaurant, which we have 200 plus in the U.S., we have 300 internationally, um, and those can go in a lot more places. And then you, now you have a to-go option, right, which only have 11 units to date, but that can go in places where maybe a bistro can't. So now we have this flexibility that we can now look at things differently and say, what, what are the best markets we're not in and what fits once we select those markets, right? So it's more market driven versus, you know, trying to solve for a certain number of each unit, right? Um, and then again, internationally, we only have 100 units and we could have thousands internationally when it's all said and done. So we're just getting started uh, in, that, in that business. But when we're talking with new partners, we're talking to a partner, with a partner in India, with one in China, with one in the UK, and having the to-go option, you know, go, they can go from saying, I can open 20 bistros to saying I can open 100 units, and we'll choose later, based on the market, which format makes sense, right? So mm -hmm. um, for us, it's, it's a flexibility, it's unit count, it's white space, and, um, and then in each market, we'll do kind of the ROI analysis to decide what, what fits. It's a really exciting trajectory. A um, couple of quick things. You mentioned, was it a Chang lane that you mentioned just before? Yeah, we call it a Chang's lane, but it, it's, it's a pickup lane that yeah. we have in, in one unit right now, but we'll, we'll use in more units going forward. Yeah, that's performing well then? It's performing very well, yeah. yeah. I, was in, I was in Texas to visit it incognito, and you know, I sneak into some of these restaurants sometimes, but the lane was bustling. I was sat there for an hour, and so many, you know, People would or they order, they come either park in front of the restaurant, walk in and pick up, or they just drive through the lane. Um, and then, you know, we just have the food ready for them, they pick it up. Um, and people love that. You know, in a lot of these suburban markets, they don't want to get out of the car. You know, I was in Dallas once and I went to a Starbucks and the line wrapped around the block, but there was nobody inside the restaurant. And I just parked and walked in and I got my, my coffee. It probably would have taken, you know, five times as long to wait in the line, but People are willing to do that because a lot of people don't want to get out of the car at all. They want the convenience. Um, and so that adds that, you know, it, it adds an option, right, which, which I think is a nice thing. Now, not every, you know, retail footprint can support one, so there's a balance of trying to open new units and finding the perfect, you know, location with, you know, visibility, Chang's Lane, et cetera. So it won't be every unit, but um, where we can, we, we found that to be a, a positive. I want to shift just to the traditional bistro that you've, uh, and you, you know, obviously you're in the middle of the, the remodel there. You've, you've done 80 of those so far, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so what were the main things you were focusing on there? You said that was, that was a lacking experience. So yeah. what was the focus and, and what does it look like now? Well, you know, people go out to eat and food is one reason. They do want good food and the quality needs to be there, but it's not the only reason. 
Um, and you can get good food you know, pretty much anywhere these days, right? You can order it, fast casual quality has gone up, um, other restaurants, but what's, what, you, what, what is really gonna drive people out is if they have a great time when they come to eat at your restaurant. Um, so we focused really on the ambiance, the experience, and that you know, means a few things. Number one, the, the actual decoration and the color scheme, et cetera, in the restaurant, um, the lighting, you know, setting the right tone with, with that, um, the music, you know, making something unique, a unique playlist that we created for, for PF Chang's that transports you to uh, you know, a different world. Um, and then even the food, right? The food was great before, but you know, it was just delivered plainly. So for example, we have dumplings that one of our, our best-selling items you know, used to be delivered on just a simple white plate. Um, now we put it on this hot stone plate, they drizzle soy sauce, the whole thing starts sizzling. And it's the same dish, but the excitement and the aura it creates is completely different. Mm -hmm. Right, and now when it comes out, people kind of look at it and say, you know, what's that, I want to order that, you know. So we call that theater at the table, right? So even dishes that we already had, just making them more interesting, more fun. Uh, we have a smoking sushi now, they smoke it in the back and they open the, the, the cap and all the smoke kind of comes out of the, uh, out of the dish. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the experience that people have when they leave and that is what draws people to come back and makes it um, easier to kind of drive frequency, which uh, ultimately drives revenue. And then when they love the brand, they'll order delivery from you too, right? So these things all lift each other. You show people a great time in the restaurant, when they want to order next, they'll think about you. Um, so I don't view it as competitive, I view it as you know, do well in each, and rising tide kind of lifts all boats in terms of the different channels that we operate in. Absolutely. Including international, by the way, because if you, you know, if you visit Miami, if some of our Latin American clients, they, a lot of them go to Miami all the time. Um, and they go to Miami, they have a great time in Brickell. When they go back to, you know, we just opened one in Ecuador. When they go back to, you know, Guayaquil in Ecuador, they're gonna think about us to go visit, right? So having them operate well across the world also, you know, helps each other. What we do here impacts our international partners. What they do impacts us. So getting that alignment was another key thing that, that we focused on um, in our business. Really wonderful stuff. We, we, you know, we haven't got much time left and uh, I do wanna open up for questions in a bit, but I, uh, look, labor, and I know you've said in the past, making yourself be as an attractive an, an employer as possible. Wages are going to keep rising. There's this huge shortage at the moment. Yeah. Um, what are you doing to either limit the, the need or reliance on as much labor in your restaurants? I mean, given that's a very labor-heavy concept, right, in your traditional restaurants. Do you have any thoughts about how the industry can, can get through this? You know, you're, you're always going to need great people. Um, we're, so two things. One, we're focused on efficiency and then focused on winning the competition for limited labor, right? So efficiency for us really means, you know, we measure it as items per labor hour. Different restaurants have different metrics, but um, making sure our people are as effective as, as they can be, right? So giving them, you know, arming them with great technology. Um, you know, we updated our reservation system. So our hosts, you know, as soon as somebody comes in, they can know who they are, what their history is. Are they celebrating something? Making that seamless versus kind of a pen and paper situation. Um, you know, for our chefs, we implemented an inventory management system that makes their job a lot easier because everything's digital versus having to track inventory on pen and paper, right? Um, you know, pay at the table, ordering at the table. So different things you can do to drive efficiency in your workforce. But, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, you, you, you need great people, and that's, that's the engine for the business. Um, so, you know, we're focused simultaneously on being as competitive as we can be in the existing labor market, even if that is, you're correct, shrinking. Um, the reality is, you know, wages is one piece of it, and wages are going up, but it's not the only, it's not the only thing people care about. Um, they want to feel valued by their employer. They want to have a connection with the people they work with and work for. They want opportunities to grow. They want to be, you know, have a chance at promotion. You know, and, and these things are all carry very meaningful weight when people make the, the decision about where they want to work. Benefits, education, you know, child care, et cetera. Um, and so not saying you shouldn't focus on wage. Obviously, in our business, you need to be competitive. But if you're only focused on wage, then you're probably making a mistake, right? Because you, know, you can be a little higher, but if people are offering more holistic package, you're going to lose, you're going to, lose to, to the competitors in that, in that scenario. Um, so yeah, wages are up. It's, it's something we have to contend with. We're managing it through efficiency and then making sure that our holistic uh, employment proposition is one that wins in the marketplace. Right. Uh, a lot of things happening in the industry right now, a lot of uncertainty ahead. In amongst all of this, and I like to ask this of everybody, is there mm. anything about the industry or our line of thinking that kind of pisses you off or you think, that's just, that just doesn't really hit the mark? 
Um, <laughs> I don't know if it, I'd say that the last point I made, and you know, I'll, I'll, get, I'll you know, criticize my, my former industry for this a bit, but I think th you know, there's a perception amongst some operators, but primarily I would say the investor community, um, to where they view people as an expense that needs to be managed versus, so for example, you know, we look at the P&L and we look at the cash flow statement as investors and we say, you know, you're investing in new restaurants, that's a cash flow expense, has an ROI, great. Technology, same thing. But people look at people as an expense to be managed down versus trying to understand what the ROI is for investing in programs for your people. Um, and maybe because I come from a private equity background, we, we've looked to quantify that, right, and say, what does it mean, you know, if we're launching a new PTO program, as an example, or, you know, whatever the case may be, what's the return on that? And I think about it as you're going to reduce, if, if you can, re, you know, improve your retention and reduce your turnover, you're going to reduce training costs, you're going to reduce recruiting costs, you're going to um, reduce the lack of productivity that's inherent when you hire a new person to take an old person's job. Um, and so what's the benefit of all that relative to the investment we're making and what sort of retention improvement do you need to make, it, you know, make the math make sense and make the ROIs work, right? Um, and so I've won over you know, <laughs> our, our investor group by kind of walking through it in, in, in that sort of terms. And I think that's just a big disconnect that I found once I shifted to the operating side that um, you know, investors typically you know, don't really get. Um, but with the limited you know, labor situation, pe more and more people are understanding that. And, I think it's an easier conversation. Uh, investing in people is something that's more, you know, being talked about now, and it's something that I think is good for the industry and good for, you know, our businesses, you know, overall. Really insightful. Do we have time for one question? We have time for one quick question. Does anybody have something they'd like to throw up here? I can't believe it. Are we yeah. do? You nailed it. You asked all the right <laughs> questions. Not a worry. Well, look. Good. Damola, thank you so much. Absolute it's been an pleasure. absolute pleasure, and uh, it's, really, it's really exciting to hear your thoughts on the industry. So thank Good. you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thank you.